Hello, so I think we're ready to begin. Um, it's 5.02, I see some people are still trickling in, but do a sort of soft opening. Uh, my name is Alma Heckman and I'm the Neufeld Levin Chair of Holocaust Studies and Assistant Professor of History and Jewish Studies at UC Santa Cruz. And it is my distinct honor to introduce the Helen Diller Distinguished Lecture in Jewish Studies and tonight's speaker, Professor Sarah Abravaya Stein. Every year we honor Helen Diller, whose generous endowment continues to provide crucial support to Jewish studies at UC Santa Cruz by hosting a public lecture on campus, or in this case on the Zoom campus, by an internationally recognized scholar. And this year that scholar is Sarah Abravaya Stein. Professor Stein is a professor of history and the Maurice Amato Chair in Sephardic Studies at UCLA, as well as the Sadie and Ludwig Kahn Director of the Alan D. Levy Center for Jewish Studies. She is the author of nine, or, and editor of nine books, including Extraterritorial Dreams, European Citizenship, Sephardi Jews, and the Ottoman 20th Century, and Plumes, Ostrich Feathers, Jews, and the Lost World of Global Commerce. Professor Stein is also the recipient of the Sammy Rohr Prize for Jewish Literature, three National Endowment for the Humanities Fellowships, and two National Jewish Book Awards. On a more personal note, Professor Stein was my PhD advisor and is the best mentor one could ask for. Um, tonight, Professor Stein and I will be in conversation about her book, which I pulled up here. Her book, Family Papers, A Sephardic Journey Through the 20th Century. Um, published with Pharaoh Strauss and Giro in, in 2019. And this book was named one of the best books of 2019 by The Economist as well as Mosaic Magazine and was a New York Times Book Review Editor's Choice as well as a finalist for the National Jewish Book Award. So welcome, Sarah. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Alma. It's such a pleasure to be here and I'm so grateful to you and everyone at the Institute um, for having me and, and across campus. Thank you. Yeah, so I thought we might begin if you'd be willing to read the first page mm -hmm. and a half, actually, of your book. Uh, I would be happy to, sure. Um, so the beginning comes within a chapter that I call Writers. This is the story of a single Sephardic family whose roots connect them to a place and community that no longer exist. The place was the port city of Ottoman Salonika, present day Thessaloniki, Greece, one of the few cities in modern Europe ever to claim a Jewish majority. The community was made up mostly of Ladino or Judeo-Spanish speaking Jews, Sephardic families who trace their ancestries back to Sepharad, medieval Iberia, from which they were expelled in the 1490s, but who for the next five centuries called the Ottoman Empire, Southeastern Europe, and Salonika home. Today, the papers of the Levy family are spread across nine countries and three continents. The single largest collection, the papers of Leon Levy, is kept by his four grandchildren in a private vault in Rio de Janeiro. It consists of nearly 5,000 handwritten and typed letters, telegrams, photographs, legal and medical documents and miscellany, address books, expired passports, and more. By far the largest private archive I have encountered as a professional historian and near obsessive document hunter. In a suitcase in a spare garage in a retirement village outside Johannesburg, there is another repository of Levy family papers, smaller than the Rio collection. The South African one is nonetheless of immense, immeasurable historical value. It includes such cherished souvenirs as a silhouette cut in Salonika in 1919, capturing the likeness of a young woman about to emigrate from her native city, never to return. Other family papers have turned up in private hands in England. One collection boxed up in a home in London has survived multiple migrations from Greece to Great Britain, to Germany, to India, back to Great Britain and onto the United States. Another housed in a scenic village outside Manchester contains fragile glass slides taken in 1917 in Salonika's Jewish cemetery, then the largest Jewish cemetery in Europe. Yet more documents, photographs, and objects have materialized in Brazil, Canada, France, Germany, Great Britain, Greece, Hungary, Israel, Italy, Portugal, and the United States. 
not only family owned papers, but documents and photographs held by 30 archives. Travel documents, naturalization papers, birth, death and medical records, letters exchanged by relatives, lovers and friends, business papers, even a baptismal certificate. All told, these scattered sources have allowed me to trace an intimate arc of the 20th century. The Levy family papers catalog the lives and losses of multiple generations, contain papers written in eight languages and reflect correspondence among members of a single family spanning the globe. This is a Jewish story, an Ottoman story, a European story, a Mediterranean story and a diasporic story. A story of how women, men and children experienced wars, genocide and migration, the collapse of old regimes and the rise of new nations. The Levy papers also reveal how this family loved and quarreled, struggled and succeeded, clung to one another and watched the ties that once bound them slip from their grasp. Thank you for that reading. Um, so, I mean, this is a very sweeping book across huge historical epochs and a number of different characters all pertaining to the same family. So I wonder if you could talk a bit about how you discovered the Levy family and these papers and introduce us to some of the characters that we encounter in the book. I'd be happy to. And um, with, the t with the indulgence of those watching on Zoom, I thought that it might be um, a nice touch to share some of the images that um, illustrate this story. And we'll, I'll just occasionally perhaps go through a few. So my exploration of this family history began with a different book, as books sometimes do. And that first book was the translation of what we understand to be the first memoir ever written in Ladino or Judeo-Spanish, the, the language of um, Southeastern European Jews of Spanish ancestry. And the author of that memoir is the man you see pictured here, Saadi Betzalel Ashkenazi Alevi. Um, and I set out with my colleague and my former teacher, so here we have a, a lineage of teachers and students, my former teacher and friend, Aaron Rodriguez of Stanford University, and um, translator Isaac Jerusalmi to bring his memoir to English language readers and also to bring this unique text, which was handwritten in Solitreo, we see here a page of it, the unique handwriting of Ladino. We set out to bring it to students of the language and students of the culture. And we did so because this man, Saadi, had a remarkable, um, tenacious, vivid um, image of the world he was living. And that was the world of late 19th century Ottoman Salonika, a world that was rapidly changing, as was his life and the life of his relatives and family. Um, and as we were finishing this project, I asked myself, well, what happened to them? What next? Uh, and sometimes you ask a question that takes you as a historian a very long time to answer. And this, this question took me uh, 10 years. And really the key to answering this question came from the document you see before you, because this memoir, which as I said, Saadi wrote over a series of, of decades, we can talk more about him, but he was a bit of an irascible man who um, piqued the ire of the rabbinical establishment of Salonika because of his, um, his radical views, which he proliferated through his um, printing press and the newspapers he edited with his sons. And they were so furious at his um, challenge to their authority that he, they excommunicated him and one of these sons. And he wrote this document really to vindicate his name. And this memoir, as you can see here, written in a really very flimsy notebook, a kind of ledger, uh, survived uh, astonishingly, not only his life, not only the life of the empire in which it was written, but survived fire and war and genocide and shifting regimes and, and migration. And it journeyed, this, this object, this memoir, it journeyed from Salonika to Paris to Rio. And um, here we see his native city of Salonika in the time that he would have written and um, begun writing the memoir. And it ended up in the hands of the grandfather of the man pictured on the right here in the hands of Leon Levy, 
uh, a descendant of Saadis living in Rio de Janeiro. And um, Leon Levy also um, was a, a saver, not only of his grandfather's, uh, excuse me, his great grandfather's memoir, but also of, uh, of letters. And that discovery um, of, this, of this journeying papers um, and a repository in Rio of family documents set me off on, on the journey that, I, that you caught a glimpse of in the reading I just offered. Thank you. I mean, and what challenges and opportunities did working with such intimate family papers provide you versus working with a sort of standard state or institutional archive? Um, well, working in institutional archives um, is also an adventure of its own, as you know, Alma, from your own research, and one never knows what one is going to find. And um, this book, like other books I've written, also relied on um, dives into archival and library collections from institutions around the world. Um, sometimes you find treasures, sometimes you find dust, um, and with it comes the historian's um, welter of emotions that research um, brings forth, the frustration, the, the excitement, the, um, the drive that is required. But working with families is a really a very different experience um, because it involves entering the homes of people who have preserved objects or papers and memories. Um, and it requires um, what a visit to an archive does not require, which is a building of a trust relationship uh, and a building of a human relationship. And one that allows you to ask not only um, how might history be written, but how does history continue to affect the lives of descendants and how is history still shaped in their memories and carried through their memories and not only their memories, sometimes also their physical characteristics or their personal foibles that once you begin to study the generations and the branching family tree, you begin to see repetition across time and space. So it, it added, I would say, a human dimension um, that made my research immeasurably richer. And sometimes, as, as I suspect we may talk about later in the conversation, sometimes also immeasurably more challenging. Yeah, I mean, we can talk about that now. I, I wonder, you know, what makes it immeasurably more challenging at times to work with family? Because, you know, I'm sure we all can think of examples when our family history or family lore might be the better way to put it is often at odds with historical record or historical documentation, um, what can be actually demonstrated versus the mythologies that shape a family and a family sense of self. Absolutely so. Um, you know, the papers that we all save um, inevitably hold secrets and they hold information that sometimes is passed in a family and sometimes strategically is forgotten and not, and not passed. Um, and the historian's job is to meddle a bit and to um, sometimes debunk myths uh, and sometimes reveal uh, unsavory truths. And it was true in this research endeavor, and this is a, a sort of painful uh, pivot in, in, in the book, it is true in this project that my research uncovered a very dark and painful chapter of the Levy family that pertains to the era of the Second World War and the discovery that a member of the family, a descendant of Saadi Betzalel Levy, whose picture we saw a moment ago, um, was the head of the Jewish police um, in Thessaloniki in Salonika, um, who abetted the Nazis in deporting the Jews um, and did so with, um, with great sadism. And um, we can perhaps speak more about this uh, as we navigate our way to the Holocaust chapter of the family's history. But for the moment, before we talk about the extent of his crimes and what became of him, I will just say that um, uh, this um, anti-hero of the Levy family history was um, 
thoroughly erased from family documents. His name was never mentioned. He was erased from family trees. He was effectively forgotten. Um, uh, not only his crimes, but also the punishment that was needed out upon him. And he was, after a very, very elaborate story of escape in, at the near end of the Second World War, he is finally arrested for cr the crime of complicity with the Nazis and um, tried by the Greek state at the behest of the Jewish community um, and proves to be, by my understanding, uh, my research, the, the only Jew in all of Europe who will be executed for the crime of complicity with the Nazis. So this is um, a very dark chapter, a chapter to uncover and um, the uncovering of it presented me with, um, with many, many challenges, how, how to write his story without it overwhelming, a much larger, richer, more complex whole, um, how to convey this trauma to the families who were so generous to me, um, and how to write his story in a way that was um, sensitive both to um, the ugliness that history sometimes is, but also to um, the feelings and um, and lives of descendants for whom this history is, is very, very personal. So that gives you a glimpse of, I think, what was the most extreme challenge of, of working with a family to tell not only the history they knew, but the history they didn't know. But it was also true that there are many um, wonderful occasions. I sometimes engaged um, in this research, which, which demanded a lot of international travel with one or both of my children. And they came to know the people uh, whose history I tell. Um, we, there were multi-generational lunches stretching over hours, sometimes with my children, with many members of their family. So this was a really um, an intimate um, historical writing process in a way that I think um, scholars of family history and um, certain other domains of history are, are accustomed to, but was for me um, um, a, a much deeper experience of this than I've had with other writing projects. Yeah, I mean, you get to know some of these characters so well, even the ones that you don't, you couldn't have met in person. One, one line that stuck out with me in my first reading of the book and still sticks with me um, as one of my favorite lines is, I think is Rachel favored violet ink. Um, I think it was yeah, Rachel, Rachel favors favorite violet ink, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and just the fact that you could pick up on those details, right, and opening a chapter with something as simple and evocative as this person uh, who you get to know throughout a chapter um, has a predilection for a kind of ink. I mean, so how do you, so you, you had the wonderful mm -hmm. benefit of getting to meet so many of these family members, but how did you go about constructing piecing together the painstaking evidence of fleshing out some of these other figures from the past in the Levy family? Uh, well, I um, part of it is the historian's blood, sweat, and tears, <laughs> uh, which demands that you get lost in a morass of sources that at first you really do not understand and you don't know who you're dealing with. You don't know who the actors are, the voices are, their relationship to each other. You can't yet make connections between discrete collections uh, or discrete individuals whose history you're telling. And there is a period of, of almost surrender to the sources where you have to commit yourself to reading and rereading and confusion and um, beginning to piece together puzzle pieces that don't always seem to fit very well. And then I think there is a time at which you um, begin to understand more and you have to reckon as a writer with a question of, of how you see a narration, how you see a story through this mess. And it, and it is kind of a mess. And it might be fun actually, um, while we speak of such matters to quickly share with you a couple of images of the documents themselves. So um, this is an example of a very legible document that one would find. It's written in Ladino. This is an example of one um, that is um, immensely frustrating <laughs> to, to read as a historian. Um, 
Uh, and um, I, I did decide at a certain point as I grappled with the question of narration and storytelling, I, I made the decision to organize this book around people. And so each chapter of the book is a person. Um, in most cases, these are people who we follow through the entire book and visit them over periods in their life uh, several times. But sometimes for various extenuating reasons, there are people who appear only once with only one chapter. Um, and while it is a work of history and not historical fiction, what I tried to do was really inhabit these people as individuals, as empathetically um, and with as much sensitivity and nuance as I could. Uh, and to think about them not from a macro level, macro historical level or a communitarian level, or even a familial level, but really think about them as individuals and how they um, appear to have, have felt through, have felt history, have reacted to historical moments, um, the things they wore, um, the way they prayed, the food they ate, um, their um, emotional quirks. Um, these were, aspects of the story that I came to feel were immensely important to humanize history and to humanize this family's history. And that brings us back to Rachel's Violet Ink, um, which I think um, speaks to something in her character. And there are so many other details that I found so poignant, you know, um, the man who has a, a distinguished patriarch of the family who was once um, a, dig a, a dignitary and a community leader who has fallen from grace and um, fallen into poverty uh, because of the financial malfeasance of his of his son who he bails out and he writes his other child that he all he has is his name he walks through the city of his birth with threadbare pants because he has not the money to um, replace them, but and yet all he has is his name. So these details that um, uh, could easily get lost in writing what really is a, a global family story, to me, were the way to anchor it as as ultimately a human story. Yeah, and yet there are human stories that map onto huge epochs that are exemplary in many ways of Sephardi history, modern Sephardi history, um, and the history of Salonika more specifically. And you have a quote, I don't know whether if you would prefer, maybe it makes more sense for you to read this mm -hmm. quote than for me because it's, it's your work after all. On page 22, sure. um, you write Saadi's children who came to maturity. And it, the, uh, the, the, sure. The, and, um, the whole paragraph. The whole paragraph. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, this is in um, a chapter called Saadi, and and this is the um, the patriarch, the originary patriarch with whom I begin the story. Saadi's children came to maturity, like the children of Sholem Aleichem's te fictional Tevia, walked down all the paths modernity offered Jews. For the centrifugal force was no less strong in turn of the century Salonika than in Boiberic. If Tevia's six fictional daughters are caricatures of the possibilities that branched out for Russian Jews of the turn of the 20th century, Saadi's children walk, walked all the byways favored by modern Sephardic Jews. One daughter, Rachel, worked as a teacher for the Alliance Israelite Universelle, a Franco Jewish philanthropic organization that provided hundreds of young Mediterranean and Middle Eastern Jewish women with a secular education and an entree into the formal workforce. One son, Shmuel Saadi, became an impassioned political commentator, throwing himself into the family business publishing and using the family's and later his own newspapers as a mouthpiece for his eclectic opinions. Fortune, another daughter, moved to Manchester, one of several Sephardic emigre centers abroad. Three more of Saadi's children would emigrate in turn. Another son, David, stayed behind, weathering the transition from Ottoman to Greek rule and serving first as an Ottoman bureaucrat and subsequently as a high ranking official for the Jewish community of Salonika. Not one of Saadi's children married a non-Jew, as did Tevye's Chava. 
yet the children gradually assimilated into various adopted milieus such that their own children would grow up worlds apart, even if still, for the most part, Jewish. Yeah, so I mean, they're really exemplary of these huge sweeping changes. And in large part, it seems to me the book is structured. You return to some characters over different intervals, but they map onto this era of Ottoman Salonika, late Ottoman Salonika. And then there's the character of Daoud Defendi, though, who races the entire tragic scope, we can say, of some of the worst things to happen best and worst things to happen to Ottoman Salonika. So I wonder if you can talk a bit about, I mean, you already mentioned his threadbare pants, but um, the Auguste character of Daoud Yes, Defendi. yes. Well, Daoud Defendi, he is a remarkable figure, right? It's, a, it's actually extraordinary, uh, his personal arc and how, as you say, it maps onto um, the sweeping history of this community. Um, Daoud Effendi, I think of him as the son who stayed. Um, he was one of the sons of Saadi who with other siblings ran the family press. He was incredibly talented um, and um, a vivacious intellectual. Um, and he began to study law as a young man. Um, but then secured a position with the Ottoman administration representing the Ottoman Empire in his home city of Salonika as the head of the passport, uh, the passport office. And this is an incredibly important position in the late 19th and early 20th century because the Ottoman Empire is now undergoing a transition of trying to transform its citizens from imperial subjects into a citizenry, a citizenry that would have the same kind of papers of state that um, the modern, other modern states of Europe would, would offer, at least at this point to their, their, the men who were deemed citizens. So Daoud Effendi kind of encapsulates in this moment um, an Ottoman Empire's navigation of um, its own transformation into a, a modern European state. Um, but the Greek, the, the Balkan Wars, 1911 to 1912, will bring his city, Salonika, from 500 years of Ottoman rule to Greek rule. And after this transition, um, there are many Jews in the community who uh, decide to leave, to begin to emigrate. Many in the family begin to emigrate, but there are many who stay. And I should pause to just emphasize that Salonika is a, a major European Jewish cultural center under Ottoman rule and into this period of Greek rule. Um, it is one of, as I said at the beginning, one of the few cities in Europe to have a majority Jewish population for a time. And um, Jewish culture was just so significant to the fabric of the urban culture. Um, such that in the late 19th century, the language you were most likely to hear in the city was Ladino and um, the city and its ports would close on the Jewish Sabbath rather than any other day of rest. So Daoud Effendi um, is the sibling who stays during this transition of Ottoman to Greek rule. And not only does he stay, but when many Jews of this community are questioning whether Jews have a place in the Greek state, he invests himself into the life of Greek society. And he does so by leading the Jewish community. Um, and he is the most important, uh, aside from the rabbi uh, of this community, he is the most important leader. So he's the most important secular leader of the community. And he serves through the interwar period as the head of this community, which is beginning to lose its place of preeminence in terms of the socioeconomic fabric of the city and even relative perhaps to um, Europe as a whole, but is nonetheless vibrant inc and um, increasingly a Greek community. Um, Daoud Effendi will, will lead the community at the time that the population transfers bring um, thousands of Greek Christians from um, Turkey to Greek territory and in return um, forcibly emigrate 
um, uh, Muslims from Greek territory to uh, Turkish lands. And um, this too will have a profound effect on Jews place within the urban landscape. He will be the head of the Jewish community when a fire really just wrecks havoc um, by destroying the urban center of Salonika, which is also the urban and economic center of its community. So he will oversee the community through this dramatic interwar period and its transformation uh, from Ottoman to Greek Jewry, which Devin Nahr writes about so beautifully in his book, Jewish Salonika. And by the Second World War, he will have already retired, but um, under Nazi occupation, as the Germans begin to suss out um, the nature of the wealth of Jewish Salonika, they will call upon the one person who knows this community better than anyone, and that is Da'ut Effendi, to write for them an account, an account of the resources of the community, the property that is owned, um, you know, the institutions that exist, the wealth that is commanded by this um, Jewish community. Uh, um, he is also, uh, and here his story ends, he is also among the oldest members of this community to be deported to Auschwitz, where he will uh, perish in the gas chambers um, along with the youngest member. He is the oldest member of the Levy family to perish there, and he perishes in the same transport with the youngest member of the family, his great granddaughter, because generations of the family um, are deported together. So what an incredible historical arc that Daoud Effendi encapsulates, as you said, it's just, it's almost, these are dots that are almost unimaginable to connect. Right, I mean, from the fire to the Holocaust, um, I mean, we see how, how papers transmit, the family papers themselves, the letters transmit so much to this information, but he is a living witness to so much of it. And as you say, the one who stayed behind, um, and there's another one who stays behind in the sort of the second half of the book, um, who after the predations of the Holocaust, after so many of the Levy family have moved on, you know, Karsa goes to India, um, a whole branch of the Salem family, Salem Levy family, they make it to Manchester, Leon is established in Rio. Um, what is the place of Salonika to this family, even after the community is all but devastated, destroyed during the Second World War? And how does the family, in the, in the records that you see, and even till today, how do they maintain a connection to Salonika? Yes, um, uh, and the family is even more far flung than that, because you have branches in Spain and branches in Portugal. Um, in addition, as you say, to India and England and Brazil, um, and ultimately Israel and Canada um, and the United States. Um, it was very important to me that this story should not end with the Holocaust because the family's history did not end with the Holocaust and the Jewish community of Salonika's history did not end with the Holocaust. Um, there are two members of the family who go back to their home after the war. Um, and they are the sister and the father of Vital Hassan, the war criminal whom I mentioned earlier. And I was really captivated, especially by his sister, um, Julie Hassan, who, um, whose name changes many times, but for the moment I'll call her Julie Hassan. Um, uh, she survives the war, um, the end of the war, not, she is not deported to Auschwitz. She and her father are deported to Bergen-Belsen along with other members of the families of the Jewish police. Um, and um, surviving Bergen-Belsen is no easy affair, but when they return to Salonika, the survivors of the Bergen-Belsen transport are vilified by the survivors of the Auschwitz transport because first they are identified with the um, with those who abetted the Nazis. And secondly, because it is, it is rightly perceived that they are transported to, um, uh, not to a death camp, but to a concentration camp where their life, although it is not easy, will not be as um, 
uh, as entirely de dehumanizing as, as would be true for those to put it to Auschwitz, where most were gassed upon arrival. Julie Hassan returns to the city um, with her father, and it is a city in ruins. Um, it is physically in ruins. Its Jewish community has been um, annihilated up to 97%, one of the highest rates of annihilation of any Jewish community in all of Europe. They are poverty stricken, they are trauma stricken. Um, there, is, um, there is a contentious relationship among different survivor communities the Bergen-Belsen transport versus those who were sent to Auschwitz, those who were in the resistance versus those who are in hiding. These groups have, uh, for various reasons, um, forms of distrust and hostility for one another. Um, but they are also, as I say, um, they are traumatized and their property has been given in most cases to um, Greek Christians. Um, they have no resources. They are um, quite li literally sleeping on park benches and, and starving in the streets of post-war Salonika. Um, and Julie Hassan is, the, is with her father. As you said, she's the one who stays. She's the one who returns and she rebuilds and she decides to stay truly against all odds, especially against, um, you know, in the face of um, the fact that family across the familial diaspora are, invi are inviting her to emigrate, to be with them. But for various reasons, she does stay and she becomes the one uh, who other members of the family visit, even if they didn't know her before they left, because some of them left when they were young, she was younger than they, they didn't have a relationship, they did not maintain a, a correspondence by letters. Some of them, most in most cases, she was meeting these cousins after the war, but she becomes a pivot. She's an incredibly competent woman. I'm gonna show you a picture because I love her picture so very much. Um, she is a beautiful woman, um, she's extremely poised, uh, and she is, um, here we see Julie Hassan on the left before the war uh, with her father. And before the war, she worked as a secretary for Daut Effendi, the head of the Jewish community. And here we see her um, after the war in the 1950s, after she has um, her, her first husband died. Um, uh, he was also sent to Bergen-Belsen, but he died before returning home. But you see her dignity. Um, you see her poise and her and her beauty, and she was um, highly intelligent, emotionally very complex, but she becomes a kind of um, maternal figure beyond her years because she is still quite young. But in some ways, um, she and also Leon Levy in Rio become figures who hold the family together. She, because she is there and she can help people with reparations during their visits, she can help them understand what happened to their deceased relatives. Um, she can help them understand what, what post-war Salonika really looks like. And Leon in Rio, because he is a feverish, a diabolically feverish letter writer. And they are these pillars who in different ways hold the family together. And in, in my view, the family begins to fray really when that generation dies. And that is the last generation that was born in Salonika when the community was intact. Um, and when that generation dies, I would say the extended family, in my view, um, arguably ceases to function as a family. Although in some ways, I think the publication of this book um, in ways that are much beyond what I ever imagined has actually served as a force of, of reunification. Right, I imagine, I imagine. Um, well, I'll ask one more question before turning to the broader audience questions. But you ask a very provocative question toward the end of the first chapter, and I'll just read it quickly. You write, it is uncommon in today's world to anticipate a letter, to relish its arrival, to stain it with tears, or to pass it to children or grandchildren as inheritance. We have infinite ways to connect, but what have we relinquished along with family papers? 
So what have we relinquished and how do family papers relate to other heirlooms or legal papers or other items even in the Levy family, such as their newspaper legacy? What, what, how do we understand the unique place of family papers? Yeah, I, I've thought about this so much. Um, you know, we produce so much noise, so much writing, so much text today, constantly. Um, we communicate um, with urgency and rapidity, but often quite thoughtlessly. Um, and letters serve a different function for these generations. Um, they are written carefully over hours and days and sometimes weeks. Um, they are a kind of risky um, thread of connection because letters are, especially at times of war, are prone to being lost. Um, but for all of those reasons, because of how uh, involved their writing is, because of how important they are to receive, because of their very vulnerability, I think that they meant so much more and they carried so many more meanings, so many more developed thoughts and emotions than the kinds of information we exchange today, the shorthand, the texts, um, that um, I think in, in the book, I write that even more than blood or belief, it, it really was papers that held the family together. Um, and I, I know that today, many, many people are driven by a genealogical impulse to find relatives through um, DNA tracing. And I wish everybody well, but what strikes me is that that connection um, of, of blood, um, in some sense, I think can't, can't match the connection of intimacy. It, it can stimulate it, but it can't on its own match the connection of intimacy that letters can create. Um, and the other kinds of documents they exchange, the photographs, the legal documents, the medical papers, and so on, were all part of the whole because these were items they exchanged um, to help one another, to protect one another, um, uh, to not only documents, but also objects like jellies um, and amulets uh, to express love. Um, and that is why I see them as an inheritance because far more than just containing information, which they do as well, they are also vectors of, of deep connection. Wonderful, well, thank you so much. And we already have, pleasure. I see a cute set of questions coming up in the queue. Um, let's see. So here's a question. Though it may have been difficult, did the families you were working with, especially those that were saving all these documents, decide to reintroduce the lost family history to their archives? I'm guessing referring to Vital's story. Um, I might need to, did the families decide to reintroduce the lost family history to their archives? Um, I see that some other others wrote in to ask about how the family received this painful story. Um, I was really quite astonished by um, the equanimity with which the family received this complex and sometimes messy history. Um, it was more sensitive to some than others because it was a more a closer to some than others. Um, but I think they were so immensely grateful to understand their long past. And for some of them, many of them, regardless of age, spanning from teenagers to nanogenarians, wrote me with the same comment that they understood themselves better because of reading this family history. Um, but it is striking that I don't know that they are maintaining archives 
anymore. The, there is a, an older generation that is holding inherited materials, but so often the family isn't continuing to build a family archive. It seems to me that that work actually stopped in the 70s with the passing of that last generation that came, that was Salonic and born. Um, and yet um, the history is there's, the future history is there's to tell at this point and who knows what, what shape it will take. Right, and there's another question about languages. Mm -hmm. um, that's a very good one in the sense that, you know, it starts off, the archives begins in Ladino and traverses many different languages. So I wonder if you could speak to yeah, it's just, it's fascinating and it would take a really long time to go through all of the complexities, but as you can imagine, um, the, ling the linguistic story tells a story of diaspora and also of reinvention um, as the families rooted themselves place to place and adopted new languages. The family, like Sephardic Jews generally and like the Jews of Salonika particularly, um, this is an incredibly multilingual community. Um, Ladino is the language of the home. Um, many learned French at school. Um, there was, some had a passing or deeper knowledge of Ottoman Turkish. Greek became a, a language of, of education and of schooling. For many, French became a language of social ascension as well as, as education. And then as they began to move, they acquired more and more. Um, but what I wanted to say is that one of the things that's so interesting is that the letters themselves are multi internally multilingual, which is absolutely typical of Mediterranean Jews, um, almost no matter where you find them, and especially of Sephardic Jews, so that you might have a letter written, let's say, in French, but that letter might use Ladino for a term of endearment and Hebrew for a benediction, and then when it came to discussing financial matters, turn to Ottoman Turkish, even when they were writing from Greece, they would still turn to certain Ottoman Turkish monetary phrases that they had grown up with. Um, so that's quite fascinating that there's, um, there's, regardless of a letter, there is no single language in a way that they are ever writing in. Um, most of the letters were written in French, um, some in Ladino, but many, in different languages and as time went on, of course, the, the number of languages multiplied. Um, and one could drill down further still and talk about the kind of French and the kind of Ladino, but perhaps that gets a little too specific for our purposes here. But it's a, it's a really rich question that I try to feel out through human relationships rather than through a kind of close reading of the text themselves. Yeah. And from that question, there's a question about two rather mute characters and how you construct them. What was it like studying the lives of the Levy family members who weren't keeping journals, writing letters, or contributing to newspapers? Two specific women stand out. My memory, Fortuna and Vida, who you note had no written documentation from their lives. Thank you for that question. That's a great one. It was very important to me that women loom large in this story. Um, both because women's history has been um, until recently neglected by Jewish historians in general and Sephardic historians in particular, and because in this family specifically, the women, um, which this is true of every family, but the women were very, very dynamic and fascinating. Some of the, the women, um, did leave a generous paper trail. That was true of Rachel, who was, um, who for many decades of her life served as a teacher for the Alliance Israelite Universelle. And she left Salonika as a, as a teenager to go study in the Alliance teacher training school in Paris. And from there went on to serve at posts across the Mediterranean, um, teaching in an, an extraordinary array of contexts from Morocco to, to Damascus to, to um, Istanbul. Um, uh, so she had left a prodigious paper trail, but there were other women who did not. And the question asker asks about two such women in particular, Fortune, who went to Manchester, um, and Vida, the wife of Daoud Effendi. Um, and I very purposefully set out to try to tell their story in the absence of documents written by them. But I came to realize in the presence of a lot of objects and um, 
evocations of them, objects that they um, that were important to them and evocations of them. So um, Vida, who is the who I suspect was illiterate because uh, of the thousands of letters saved by her son Leon in in Rio de Janeiro, there's none in her hand and only one dictated by her to her daughter um, and written in Ladino. Um, and yet she sent other things. She sent uh, prayers. She sent uh, an amulet, um, or amulets plural. She sent um, delicacies to her children abroad. Um, and similarly for Tune, uh, I was not able to lay hands on a, a vast written record that she left behind, but there was so much else. The farm she created, um, you know, photographs of her, the clothing that she wore, um, even um, her gravesite. Uh, so I realized that although there were people like Leon or Sam Levy who, uh, or even Rachel who um, were noisier and it might've been easier to focus on them because of the, of the voluminousness of the words they left, that I wanted to be able to honor the histories that were, that were quieter in a sense. Um, and yet nonetheless as fully lived and as historically important. Thank you. Um, so I see another question. I'm very curious, especially with your academic historian's eyes, did this project change your sense of the importance of ancestral lineage? Do family lines of causality stand out to you anymore now, even in history slash subjects where they're not so apparent? Um, I was really struck by um, continuities in this family's history that I did not expect. Continuities of, um, of personality, personality traits, um, continuities in, in profession. Uh, this is stretching you know, to seven, eight generations, um, a feel for music for example, a flair for languages, um, an irascible tendency. Um, I somehow did not expect um, these things to travel so persistently along the branches of the family tree. So I was indeed struck by um, the way in which family continued to matter, even to those people who were entirely unaware of their family entirely unaware um, and who weren't able to read about their family in these documents that I unearthed because they didn't know the languages, um, especially Ladino. Um, so I think that it did give me um, a renewed or rather a sharpened sense of the importance of ancestry, um, not because it is destiny, but because it is persistent. Another question about the historian's craft. Do you think professional critical distance is actually possible when working on such intimate and personal histories? Um, I'm not sure I ever had the goal of aspiring towards professional distance. Um, I did have the goal of aspiring towards professional standards of documentation, of fidelity to the historical record. Um, I would never put words in anyone's mouth. Um, I would never describe things beyond what I was able to document historically. So in that sense, I would never stray into what felt to me more like the terrain of historical fiction. But there's a difference between that and demanding um, what was the phrase that they used? Demanding professional distance? Yes, professional distance. Distance, distance. yeah, because I think that these histories felt very close and I wanted them to feel very close. I wanted them to feel, um, I don't involve myself very often as a, as a character in this book, ever so rarely I do, but, but very, with a very light touch. Um, and yet it, simply wouldn't have been possible to tell this history without my involvement uh, of um, who I am as a scholar and a person. Um, 
you know, in some ways, even as I mentioned before, as the person who brings along a child on a research trip, it changes the process. Um, so professional distance was never my goal, but professional um, professionalism and professional thoroughness um, was. And I think that um, the results, um, one can kind of feel the results in, in, in the way that I, that I wrote the story. There are a whole bunch of questions that I'm trying to look through because in the interest of time, there's so many good ones. And don't worry, if your question doesn't get answered, all these questions will be sent to Professor Stein after the talk. Um, but here are a couple of open-ended questions. One, are the questions that you could not fully answer, are there questions that you could not fully answer that you will continue to pursue? And that relates to a question of mine, what didn't make it into the book? Um, and two, has the research changed the way you teach undergraduate courses? And I see that that comes from a childhood friend who is also a distinguished scholar of history, Sarah Kimball. So sending love your way. Um, these are great questions. Um, yes, there were things I couldn't answer. Um, that There were things I couldn't answer. Um, there were some dead ends that I could not muscle my way through. Um, family lines that I lost track of, not, not because I didn't try or not because of, but just because they evaded the historical record or they evaded me. I thought that I wouldn't continue to pursue them, but they have a way of nagging at you. And interestingly enough, you know, history kind of has a way of surfacing, <laughs> even if you don't intend it to, because inevitably after the book's publication, people came forward who I had not found, who were re related to the family, who had stories and documents of their own. Um, and I'm in touch with these people and I um, have been reading their materials and um, uh, I haven't decided yet if I will continue to pursue them, I think. But um, I think I accept the maxim that no book is ever really finished or complete and, and maybe that that's quite all right. Um, in terms of whether it's changed the way I teach undergraduates, um, um, I think actually it grows out of the way I teach undergraduates. It grows out of a desire to convey um, complex stories in a narratively driven fashion. It grows out of my understanding that um, that while macro histories are important and engaging, if we can't ground them in people and in lives, they become incredibly elusive um, and in a way therefore less meaningful. Um, so my research and my teaching are always in conversation with each other. Um, and I think this is, um, this book in some ways grows out of my um, appreciation over many decades of teaching of um, what kind of stories seem to move us and seem to engage us and what kind of stories help us understand the broad strokes of history without losing track of the fine-grained nature of, of individual lives. And I think we have time for just one more question. Um, it's a question that pertains to the future says, what is the situation today of Jews in Salonika and the heritage of this history in modern Thessaloniki? Other than the cemetery, which is about the end, is there something else we can say about the future? There is a small Jewish community in, in the city. Um, it is passionate about telling the story of its past. Strikingly, there are also Greek Christians who you know, in some of the same ways that we have seen um, Christian Poles, for example, want to tell the hidden Jewish history of their own community. We also see the same thing in Thessaloniki, that there are um, Christians who um, might have no apparent personal connection to this history, but see it as a collective story. Um, there is a um, quite impressive Jewish museum 
um, there has been an active project pioneered in part by this museum and by the municipality. Um, I didn't tell this story, but to uncover the graves, uh, the gravestones of the Jewish cemetery that were um, desecrated in the course of the Second World War by the Greek municipality um, with the um, permission of the German occupying forces. And they were used um, as building material. And there is an active effort today to retrieve those stones and either erect them at the cemetery, preserve them in the museum, or actually put them on display. Um, still, for all of these efforts, I would say that if you move through present day Thessaloniki, the Jewish history is quite um, difficult to grasp hold of unless you really know what you're looking for. Um, it is not um, heavily signed in the way one finds in other European centers. Um, it is very difficult, I think, for residents and visitors to the city, residents of and visit, visitors to the city, to really fathom how um, indelible, seemingly indelible and present was the imprint of Jewish culture on the city. That is very, very hard to grasp hold of today. Well, thank you. We're out of time, but thank you so much, Professor Stein, for sharing your wisdom with us and talking about this book. Um, I encourage everybody to go out and read it if they haven't already. It truly is one of the most remarkable books of 2019 and 2021, dare I say. Um, so thank you again so much. I, I will clap in my little box. Um, maybe. Thank you so much. It's been a it's been a pleasure. And thank you, Alma, for the great conversation. Thanks to everyone who tuned in. Thank you all.